那大家等了一下，那呃，我们今天很高兴，就是呃，请到我们基本收入的作者，就是 Philip from Paris 教授，就是特别来到这里，然后跟大家分享他为什么要倡议 basic income 这样子的一个主题。吼，那其实呃。魏城一直在做很多有关于不平等的艺术的书哈，以跨你可能大家有知道是，比如说像阶级世代，然后像二十一世纪资本论哈，这些基本上都在回答，或是试图去指出那个不平等的现象。那其实在这边，在三年前，同样在这个地方，就是那个 t o m a s Piketty 教授也在这里跟大家见面过这样。那三年后，我们再来出《Basic Income》这个书，其实它有很大的目的，就是想要去回应我们。当然，我们知道说这几年的不平等情况很严重的时候，那我们对不平等是不是只有束手无策，还是说我们可能有一个更好的想象，或是说更大胆的想象？它有什么可能性去解决？那其实我觉得 basic income 是一个可能对很多人来说有一点 radical 哈，就是蛮激进的、蛮大胆的。那甚至很多人会会很质疑，想要挑战它的一个解放。但是我觉得我我我很 impress， 就是非常印象深刻，就是 f o m Paris 教授他讲的，就是他到底是左派还是右派？其实大家可能看书就会知道，他事实上可能是一个捍卫资本主义的人哦，因为他觉得。哎，既然就是我们经历过八零九零年代的呃共产革命，或者是说所谓苏东坡的一个结束结束哈、哦，那是不是是不是我们在资本主义的社会也有可能提出所谓的 utopia 这个概念？哎，有没有一种 utopia 是建立在资本主义的经济上面的？有没有这个可能性？然后他一九九五年有一本很著名的书，就是《Real Freedom for All》。就是他这个 freedom 是他一个非常重要的概念，就是他所有的一切的设计都是在建立在每一个人如何拥有真正的 real freedom， 不是形式上的自由而已。对，所以我觉得大家可能可以从这个精神里面去想。那我我会觉得，如果今天回来讲这个 basic income， 其实我觉得这个议题它对大家很重要，是说，也许你不一定赞同。但是我觉得他会刺激你去想，其实他他的这个问题，终究他可能是要回应我们每一个人的生命历程哈、哦。就是说，今天你当我们每一个人都很平等的出生在这个世间，我们每一个我们，因为在场人可能，就是我们基本上是很平等的生命。但是为什么你今天会是某个某某某样子的人？你今天为何是某个阶级的人？那这个东西可能是很多社会因素进来的。那呃，就是你为何你会现成为现在的你，跟此刻的你想要什么，跟未来的你想要什么，其实都跟这些社会制度是纠整个缠绕在一起的。所以我觉得其实呃，所谓说 basic income 这边不是只有呃政策的人或者是呃政治运动的人才要去想象，而是我们所有的人也都有公平想象未来的能力哈，跟那个权利。对，所以我觉得这是我们今天很想要推出这本书的理由。那我接下来就先把时间交给那个叶浩老师，他会先帮大家做一个呃，就是简要的一个介绍，然后之后再请封 Paris 教授呃来说明他的理念。那我们就来欢迎他们两位。啊，呃，非常高兴见到大家。那我我呃，我先做一个很简短的介绍，大概十分钟以内。啊，但 Paris 他，嗯，基本上他是在目前整个国际上有呃十几个国家都已经正式的呃在推动呃 basic income 的这个想法。那他等于是在这个运动的背后一个非常重要的人，他是。提供啊、呃、理论基础、哲学基础的人，那也许他不是在第一线上最热烈的人，但是呢，呃，他其实也已经跑了好多个地方，说今年已经跑了超过十个国家，然后基本上啊、呃、各大洲他都去了，四处尽可能的在推动这一个呃基本收入的想法。那他关于基本收入的想法，基本上是在一九七七年的时候，就是。他在开始啊、呃、思考，一边读着马克思的理论，然后在思考人类的未来处境应该往哪里走的时候，才慢慢呃慢慢想的
。那在五年左右的时间，在一九八二年的时间，他就已经完成了他基本的看法，认为呃他想要推动这个想法。那根据一些小道消息呢，呃就是呃教授他也跟我们讲说。呃，有点像阿基米德一样，他是在洗澡的时候想到这个想法了，觉得这个想法可以解决整个世界的最大的问题，比马克思还有用一点点啊，也就是也就是他可以解决，他可以解决啊、呃、市场经济所带来的很多的失联而产生的问题，特别是贫富差距，然后还有在啊传欧洲的传统的这些社会福利的国家。常常有官僚体制过于庞大，然后呃，甚至比如说，如果是政府需要去帮助无家可归的穷人，那无家可归的穷人他在哪里住在哪里？他就是无家可归，所以他没有办法有稳定的地址、联络的地方而去领救济金，呃，甚至还要有呃财产的审查等等这些的，就没办法做到。所以呃呃，教授他是在想的是在。彻底革命跟传统的社会福利制度也不足以因应或回应整个资本主义的肆虐而造成的各种呃呃问题，所以呢，他认为呃基本收入是一个方案。那基本收入非常特别，他的思想的来源呢，其实是从 Thomas More， 基本上等于就是大家是这样子认为。就是在乌托邦里面就已经有简略的有想过这个想法，那这是英国人，呃 ，Thomas More 摩尔他在，呃，一五一六年的时候就已经有简单的提过这个想法，但是呢，我刚刚吃饭的时候问了一下啊、呃、，Van Paris， 然后他他说呢。呃，他不太认为是 Thomas More 第一个想的，因为里面有简单的提过，但是呢，真正真正想出这一个想法的是 Thomas More 的好朋友是 d e v i s 啊，但是呢，呃 ，Thomas More 他的乌托邦其实是在鲁汶出版的，他是英国人，牛津毕业的，然后这本书是在鲁汶出版的，然后呢，他的好朋友 d e v i s 是在鲁汶认识的。那呃，我们大家都知道 ，Van Paris 他本身也是来自于鲁汶，我们就觉得这中间有一些非常啊、呃、有趣的啊、呃、connection， 就是怎么全部都是在 l u f a c t o r i g i n a l in l u f a c t the idea， 嗯，那啊、呃，那这个想法其实呢，从他的角度来讲，也不是那么那么的新，因为五百年前就已经有人约略想过。这这是一个解决贫穷，呃，一次到位的比较好的方式。那但是呢，刚开始提出的时候呢，其实摩尔跟他的好朋友 d e v i s 他们两个有一个很大的差距。那个差距是，呃，到底政府给基本收入要不要附带让他们有相应的劳动？所以他不是一个无条件的。Thomas More 认为说可以啊、呃，呃，就是。两两个人的争辩其实是在于他是该有条件还是无条件，但是呢，时至二十世纪的时候呢，从整个八零年年代开始，那 Van p e r i s 教授他出了这一本书之后呢，呃，他替呃基本收入奠定下一个非常深厚的哲学基础，但是从那个时候开始呢，呃，整个掀起的逐渐开始的一个基本收入运动。也慢慢的分成两种不太一样的想法，整个提倡基本收入的基本上都认为它是一个不带有任何其他义务的，所以它也称为叫全民，呃，基本收入也称为叫做呃无义务或者是呃无条件的基本收入，但是呢，一直到现在为止，呃，其实基本收入的主张大致上有两个不太一样的路线。Van Paris 教授呢，他主张的是，嗯，基本收入必须要在一个国家全民同时实施，彻底的全民同时实施。可是有另外一边有一个跟着他已经二十几年的朋友，同时在推动了这个想法的一个英国人，呃，盖斯丹林，啊，他也出了一本书，在今年，呃，有另外一本书《Basic Income》，那他提出的想法是。可以在小规模每个国家里面的城镇底下去做小规模的实验
，这可以，但用不着一次就到位，全国一起做一个大规模的实验。所以现在的基本收入的倡议者，基本上有两个不太一样的做法跟策略。那反派里斯教授基本上他采取的或他站的立场是一个，必须是全国同一个时间点一起实施，钱不一定要非常的多，但是必须是全国一起实施。那对他来讲，呃，他的他他认为从小城镇乡镇底下实施的成果，虽然它像是一个做实验，因为有很多国家都已经尝试在做，但是那个成果呢？对百克里斯教授来讲，我们没办法从一个乡镇的成果来推出全国到底好不好。所以，呃，在最新的这一本书里面，啊、呃，这本书里面其实有很清楚的他的主张，就是来告诉我们说，啊、呃，他想要怎么做。那这本书的中文版，呃，里面，呃，就就基本上，我们也可以把它理解为是一个基本收入的基。基本收入的教战手册，或者是他很清楚的，也有点像嗯天主教的教义问答啊，就是你有任何各种问题，其实在这一本书里面，阅阅都可以找到一些答案。但是他特别强调有两个层面，跟之前的书不太一样的是，第一个是他要回应很多经济学上的问题跟质疑，特别他在经济学的部分，他很小心的指出为什么小规模乡市城镇的。实验无法推出全国到底适不适合，所以他有很多呃经济的论述在这本书里面。那有另外一个更更重要的是，在这本书，呃，他也要回应所有人认为政治上可能有困难无法达成的。所以在这本书啊、呃，他有一个作者是经济学家，跟他一起和谐。那这位经济学家他就负责了非常多。有关于怎么把这个想法落实到实际的政治上，而且呢，怎么去解决呃，在政治的实务上，让这件事情变成呃条件充足可以可能。所以，在这本书里面，跟他之前的很多的相对比较浓的哲学的想法有不一样的地方，因为在这本书的最后面大概五分之一的篇幅，都是来告诉我们说他怎么可能，怎么样可以做得到。那。呃，这这也是他最近以来就是非常重呃重要的工作。其实他跑了很多的地方，跑了很多国家，就是要为了要告诉大家，啊、呃，他现在最新的想法就是政治上他绝对是可行的。那我我就先呃介绍先讲到这里，等下来听听看，呃，把 Paris 教授他怎么样子来认为。那我今天呃人不少，那我希望到最后我们可以有比较多的时间，呃，希望 Q&A 比较多的时间。那在 Paris 教授他。昨天下午才来到台湾，然后基本上也很累，他有时差，那呃，所以我们等一下他大概是讲呃半个小时左右，然后我们就开放问答，希望呃大家等一下可以有踊踊跃的问他。那我们现在把时间交交给他。OK，Thank、okay. you。I don't know what you said, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, right. So I think uh, something is going to be written there so that everyone understands. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, lots of kind people uh, in uh, this country. So I'm here to uh, present you very briefly. A book that took me and my co-author a long time to prepare. It's a book about a very simple idea, uh, very very simple, an idea that was hardly discussed, hardly known, until just a couple of years ago, where suddenly it erupted uh, into the public debate, more or less simultaneously in several countries. It's not that the idea hadn't been discussed before, but it was restricted to fairly small circles of intellectuals, academics, and activists. It's only uh, in the last couple of years that it erupted. I am sure that uh, in the year 2016, last year, more words were written and more words were pronounced about this idea. 
than in the whole history of mankind. So, and that's from California to Korea to Finland to France, etc., etc. Uh, what we try to do in this book is uh, to give really a comprehensive uh, discussion of all aspects of uh, this uh, idea of the arguments in favor of this idea, but also against this idea. We defend the idea. We think it is a very important proposal for today's world, in every country in the world, though in different ways in the, uh, different countries. But our basic conviction when writing this book is that it was also very important to clarify many confusions that are made about this idea by those who attack it, but also by those who defend it. And that it was important not only to clarify these confusions, but to correct many mistakes that are made by those who attack the idea, but also by many of those who defend it. I think that sometimes it's okay to defend a good idea with a bad argument. And you can win a television debate uh, in this way by using bad arguments for a good idea. But in the end, good ideas will only become reality if you defend them with good arguments. And that's really what's central in this book, is that. So that, uh, as well, I mean, about the history of the idea, but also about the economics of it, the philosophical discussion, the political support and non-support in various political families, we try to get the facts right. So a lot of fact-checking was needed for this book, and then we try to present this in a systematic way. Uh, what uh, unreadable way, I should say, so uh, I should add perhaps that uh, uh, my other academic books uh, were only copy edited fairly lightly by the publishers where uh, I'm, I'm, I, need, I have two native languages which are Dutch and French but I write in English so sometimes my style needs to be made a, a little bit better uh, than it is but usually it's very light uh, uh, editing. In this case, uh, Harvard University Press, instead of outsourcing to someone from the outside to do this copy editing, thought this was a book that needed to be edited by someone from the inside, and so they asked the editor of the Harvard Business Review to really uh, uh, look at the book very closely, and she did many, many stylistic improvements to make it more readable. We had to re-correct it a number of things, maybe just a thousand or so, but uh, because by making it prettier, sometimes you make it wrong. So it was important uh, to try to, uh, to get it straight, but the book really became more readable and was immediately translated into several languages, including today uh, also the, the complex characters, uh, Chinese. I uh, won't be very long, what I want uh, to uh, do very briefly is uh, uh, just clarify the idea itself by uh, contrasting it with the two previous model, the models, the two existing models of social protection which uh, uh, compose, which are the, the two ingredients of our existing welfare states throughout the world and that appeared earlier in history I'll introduce the basic income, basic income against that background, and then I'll answer the question, why today? Why is there a sudden popularity for this idea? First then, uh, the history of uh, uh, social protection. Social protection meaning material security uh, that is provided by the public authorities, by the government. Um, I, uh, from what I understood in what you said, you already uh, mentioned something about that because uh, the uh, first model of social protection is what's commonly called social assistance or public assistance. It is uh, in what you could call aid to the poor or charity for the poor organized by the public authorities. This was a radical idea at the beginning of the 16th century. Until then, I'm talking about Europe, where this form of social
social assistance uh, her first appeal, but of course, thinking about East Asia, uh, something similar uh, happened, and the two models also exist, or they appeared at different times. For the first model of social assistance uh, uh, arose when some small municipalities, some small towns in uh, Flanders, uh, which is now part of Belgium, and in Germany, started uh, saying, well, it's our job as public authorities to look after the poor in our town, just in our town, not those coming from outside, but just in our town. And it's our job because we'll do it better than private charity by individuals and also than the church which was in charge, the Christian church, the Catholic church, which took it upon itself until then. They'll do it better, they said, because it's the best way to find all the poor, uh, so that all the poor people, the poor households would be covered, and only the poor, uh, because sometimes there are cheaters, they said, and we want to uh, uh, avoid giving money to the people who claim that they are poor and are not. So it's our job to do that. And the, the motive for it was that at that time, beginning of the 16th century, there were more and more beggars, people coming to beg in these towns and uh, tank and they were sitting in front of all the churches in crowds and showing sometimes their, their uh, wounds and their invalidities and, uh, and so that happened so first in a few towns and then it spread from those towns to England which was the first country to uh, industrialize bit by bit to start manufacturing that became then a, a national gradually spread throughout uh, England, it was top down to some extent. The king, the queen uh, of England uh, installed and uh, created what was called the poor laws, the poor laws, laws of the poor, which became a model also for the rest of Europe and later for uh, North America was exported there. That was the first model, so really uh, a model of uh, that consisted in gathering some money, initially it was money volunteered by the rich, but then later it took the form of compulsory taxation in order to help the poor. Yeah? Targeted at the poor, often requiring for, from them to, to work or to be available for work. There were the poor houses where the poor were made to work, etc. And then came a big crisis, a big crisis. At the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, uh, a number of uh, very influential uh, intellectuals and, uh, but also policy makers started saying this is going to be a catastrophe. A catastrophe because the more you help the poor, the more poor there are. That is, the more people and the more poor people there will be. Why is that? Well, in part because you give them money and then they stay there. They, they, they receive the money month after month and they don't, uh, uh, they have, even if you try to make them work, they work very inefficiently, etc. and they remain in that situation of dependency. Moreover, the more you help the poor, the more they procreate, the more they make little poor kids uh, by, uh, you, uh, because you enable them to have a family and to have to, 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 to reproduce more and more children who will be poor in turn. This is a disaster. So instead of suppressing, abolishing poverty, uh, the uh, whole poor laws, the whole, this whole system of public assistance is multiplying the poor. And you have there probably uh, some names uh, known to some of you. And one of those was Thomas Malthus, uh, the, the founder of uh, the Wabahots now still called Malthusianism, the man who said well, it's going to be a population explosion among the poor, we must stop that very quickly. But some other uh, very influential intellectuals took the same stance. For example, David Ricardo, one of the founders of economics, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, the French sociologist who is a famous analyst of the French and the American Revolution, uh, Hegel, the German philosophers, they all said, this is terrible. Let's go back to private charity. Huh? Because by helping the poor through the public authorities, this is leading to disaster.
And then, fortunately, at the end of the 18th century, someone had another idea, very different from the first one, which then led to a second model, very slowly, to a second model of social protection, of form of, uh, uh, of uh, economic security. And the idea that was first concocted, imagined by the French uh, philosopher and mathematician and activist, uh, uh, Marquis de Condorcet, um, was the model of uh, so model of so-called social insurance, which can be uh, presented very simply as follows. It's no longer a matter of helping the poor. It's a matter of, for all the workers to uh, pay some social contributions into a fund. And this fund will then cover them, will then use to cover them when some risks materialize, when they become old, or when they become sick, or when they become unable to work for another reason, when they become involuntarily unemployed. Okay? And so this is a very different model. It's a model of social insurance. No longer the rich helping the poor, is the workers helping each other and by uh, paying in good times so that they can be protected in bad times. That took a, quite a long time to be implemented for the first time at the end of the 19th century under Bismarck in Germany. For the first time, for not because he was a very nice man, very generous to the poor, but because he wanted to unify Germany, and so thought it's a good idea to create this state pension so that every worker in Germany will know that the state is doing something for them because there will be a state pension for them. It was very low in the beginning, but uh, that created some sort of allegiance to Germany, which until then, until the 19th century, had never existed as a single state, unlike England or France or Spain, which had these uh, country, I mean, nations for a long time, not in Germany. But he used that, and at the same time, there was a movement called the Socialist Movement, which uh, made him uh, afraid, which made him fear that the elites would be overthrown, inspired by Karl Marx, by Marxists. So he thought uh, it was a way of getting the workers on his side, of preventing them from being revolutionaries. So that's led, that's what, what's led to the, the introduction, bit by bit, of a second model, model of social insurance. Huh? So it's no longer charity for the poor, it's solidarity among the workers. Huh? Now, in all our existing welfare states, huh, redistributive systems, in Taiwan, like in the United States, like all over Europe, like in Russia, like in Brazil, you have these two components in the welfare states, but in very different proportions. In uh, the more, in the countries with the more developed welfare states, social insurance, the second model, is by far bigger. In other emerging countries, in Brazil, for example, they have a, a very big social assistance system, which is uh, I, I believe in volume the biggest in the world, uh, but which is targeted at the poor uh, parts, the poor households in the population. I think there are about uh, 15 million uh, households, uh, that is uh, something like uh, 35 or 40 million people who benefit from uh, this uh, scheme called Bolsa Familia, which is a social assistance scheme. So that's the background. Some people, like the French socialist leader uh, Jean Jaurès at the end of the 19th century, thought that the second model would not just save the first one, it would replace the first one completely. That there would be no need anymore for help to the poor because all the workers would be covered by this social insurance system. But that turned out not to be the case. And even in France, the, so instead of uh, uh, abolishing uh, social assistance, it had, in the course of the uh, 20th century, it had to be generalized. And I gradually uh, turned social assistance into a very general um, uh, minimum income system, which exists again in a number of countries. In the United States, it's far more rudimentary and fragmented than in some European countries, or in Australia, or in Canada, 
Uh, in the, but in many countries you have then, uh, for all the people who are uh, not uh, covered by or not sufficiently covered by either uh, wages or uh, the social insurance system, there is a, system, a guaranteed minimum income system that secures and that makes sure that no household falls below a certain threshold. But, but, and this is where basic income comes in, but this guaranteed minimum income system, when it exists, of the social assistance, so is conditional in three senses, in which three senses in which basic income is unconditional. And it's because of the difficulties related to these conditionalities that gradually people have been thinking about the basic income in societies with developed welfare states and advocating quite a radical reform which consists in introducing a really unconditional basic income. What are these three senses in which social assistance is or tends to be conditional and in, in which uh, a, a basic income is not? Firstly, uh, uh, social assistance is always directed at the household. You check whether the household as a whole is poor or not poor and you give an income only if the income of that household is below a certain level. And you give it usually to the head uh, or the person regarded as the head of the household. The basic income instead is strictly individual. Hmm? Everyone receives a basic income, every individual, and the amount of the basic income does not depend on the family situation. So in all social assistance system, if you are on your own, you, if you live on your own, you get a basic income, you get a, a benefit that is higher than what you would receive if you lived in a, as part of a couple. Hmm? That can easily be explained because it costs more per capita per person to live on your own than to live uh, in a larger group. Basic income is strictly individual. No one needs to check whether you have a partner, whether you live in a broader family, you receive. Okay? Second, uh, second uh, conditionality for the traditional, the existing systems, it is means tested. That is, whether you are entitled to it or not depends on your income. Hmm? Only the poor receive it, right? Basic income is universal. It's no need to check whether you have an income or not, how high your income is, the rich receive it as well as the poor. That's the second feature of the second unconditionality that is specific to basic income. And then the third unconditionality is uh, what we call in our book obligation freeness, uh, being obligation free. We initially wanted to call it duty free, but duty free has other connotations, I suppose, for, to anyone who's been to any airport in the world. So uh, we called it obligation free, and that is to be understood as uh, the absence of any work test, or of any obligation to work or to be available for work. If you have a job and you give it up, you are voluntarily unemployed, and yet you get the basic income. In most social, insure, uh, social assistance systems, so the existing guaranteed income scheme, this is not the case. You only get it if you are available for work, okay? So these are uh, the three features uh, that uh, uh, characterize a basic income. So where did this, this ID come from and uh, what stage has it reached uh, now? Well, um, the first uh, formulation of something close to a basic income uh, was, is due to Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a friend of Condorcet, who I mentioned before, um, uh, living in Paris also part of the time, and one of the great ideologues of uh, the rights uh, of man, uh, human rights. He published a book in the 18th century under that title, one of the great intellectuals behind the American Revolution, and to some extent also the French Revolution. He published a little pamphlet 
for the government of France at the time called agrarian justice, in which he said we are all, all the members of society are morally speaking the joint owners of the land. But the land of a country is privately appropriated by a small portion of the population. That's not just. And on the grounds of justice, not charity, he said, in fact, the, the value of that land and the rent you want on that land should be equally shared by all citizens, by all the members of a society. And the form he proposed to give to it was to uh, give a basic endowment, a uh, sum of money, to every young person when reaching the age of 21, man or woman, rich or poor, it didn't matter, and then also the form of a basic pension, universal for everyone, from age 50. Uh, someone else at about the same time made a proposal on similar grounds, but saying it has to be organized at the level of every parish, every local entity, must be paid on a regular, uh, and must be paid on a regular basis. That was someone called Thomas Spence, also English. He was, he, he was very, very much against Thomas Paine, because Thomas Paine was very famous, and he found this, that uh, Thomas Paine's proposal was too modest. Um, so he claimed that his own proposal was far more generous and would be paid on a regular basis. The first person to propose that on, at the level of a whole country was someone called Joseph Charlier in 1848, uh, publishing a, a book called Solution of the Social Problem in Brussels. At the same time, 1848, as Karl Marx was writing also in Brussels the, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. You know that the Manifesto of the Communist Party had quite a bit of uh, worldwide success. I think there is a country not so far from here in which it's still the official uh, reference document, whatever is made in practice, uh, in order to conform to uh, what was advocated in that little book. But it, certainly this little book, I mean, beautifully written, and <laughs> I must say, uh, so, by this young man who was 28, 29 uh, at the time and was living not very far from where I live uh, now uh, in Brussels, changed this little book, Changed the History of the World, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. Instead, this other little book, Solution du Problème Social, also written by a young man, had no influence whatever. We've never found anyone citing the book. We're not sure anyone read it. It's only a British researcher who discovered it not that long ago. And yet today you may wonder which of the two uh, proposals, which of the two utopias has more future in uh, today's uh, world. So there were other people on and off in the 19th century, century who discreetly and uh, made proposals of this type. But the first sort of debate only arose uh, uh, Rose occurred uh, after the First World War in England, very brief, but it continued some major intellectuals to up the idea under the name Social Dividend. One of them is James Mead, who got the Nobel Prize in Economics <coughs> later on, and uh, became a member of the Worldwide Network on, on Basic Income towards uh, the end uh, uh, of his life. And there was a debate, short, but uh, significant, at the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s, in the United States. There were some progressive uh, economists, uh, one of them was James, uh, James Tobin, also a few later Nobel laureate in economics, known for, among other things, for his Tobin, so-called Tobin tax on financial transaction, uh, transactions. Another one was John Kenneth Galbraith, very popular uh, Harvard uh, uh, economist. And they convinced a candidate, a democratic candidate for president, George McGovern, who won the primaries. They convinced him to put basic income, then called demogram, in his program for, uh, the, for the primaries, which he won. And then uh, he realized that it was being ridiculed, that was against Nixon at the time, uh, the idea was being ridiculed, and he dropped it, or had a much watered down version for the presidential election itself against Nixon, which he lost disastrously. But uh, that led to some experiments of something related to basic income called negative income uh, tax, but uh, 
DND after the 70, 1972 presidential election, DND was killed in the United States for decennia. It only came back very recently. The contemporary debates really started in Europe at the beginning of the 1980s. Beginning of the 1980s, a little bit in Denmark, more significantly in Holland, and then here and there there were some people defending ID Steiner. In 1986, I gathered in Louvain-la-Neuve, in my university town, a few people I had discovered um, defended that ID, but who had come to that ID independently, as I had done, without knowing about the other people, and who didn't know each other. We created then a, a, a little network, which was called the Basic Income European Network, little network that grew and grew. In, uh, we had a congress every second year. 2004, we had a congress in Barcelona where uh, the, the, the network became a worldwide network. And today, there is a, a section in about 30 countries in the world, including Taiwan, including mainland China, including uh, Mexico, Argentina, uh, etc., etc. And this little network has contributed greatly to the spreading of the ID uh, in uh, various uh, countries. Um, maybe the most uh, significant events recently, and that helped them feed the spreading of this uh, ID, were, perhaps I'll mention uh, four of them. One was that in Switzerland, uh, small European countries, small European country, uh, where they have uh, a greater use of direct democracy referendums than anywhere in the world, and more ref national referendums have been uh, organized in uh, Switzerland than in the whole of the world uh, together, in all other countries of the world together, at the national level. Uh, and uh, it's enough for ha to have a national referendum that you have 100,000 validated signatures uh, requiring, uh, uh, asking the government to organize one. There was one on basic income. Uh, with a very high level of basic income being sort of uh, uh, indicated by the initiatives. It was uh, uh, about $2,500 per month and per person. That's 39% of GDP per capita in uh, Switzerland, so a very high amount. The referendum was defeated. Had it passed, it would have been like an article in the Constitution of Switzerland, so it was defeated by about three quarters against one quarter, but it spread the idea not only uh, inside Switzerland, but far beyond. Second uh, event, surprising to me, is that uh, the candidate for, uh, the, one of the candidates for uh, the nomination as candidate uh, uh, for the presidential election in France for the ruling party, Socialist Party uh, at the time, Benoit Mont, last year, and so the Swiss referendum was last year in June 2016, French candidate, again it was the same scenario as uh, in the US with McGovern uh, this year before, he came out with that proposal in the primary, to everyone's surprise he came first uh, in the first round before the sitting uh, prime minister, uh, Emmanuel Valls, uh, there was a second round where only the two, the top two were uh, remained, so he and, and the former Prime Minister, and he won with, as a central proposal, much discussed in the whole campaign, universal basic income. Then there was the presidential election itself. He modified uh, his, he delcorated, weakened uh, uh, his proposal, partly on the advice of Thomas Piketty, who he had uh, recruited as one of his advisors, and his wife, who was his economic, uh, Thomas Piketty's wife, and so it didn't quite look anymore like a real uh, basic income, and he lost the presidential election disastrously, as uh, did McGovern uh, many decennia before, and Emmanuel Macron uh, won. Now the loss was, in neither case, was the loss due uh, to the defense of a basic income, which doesn't mean that uh, <laughs> having the basic income on the, uh, on the program more firmly for the election itself, uh, would have uh, won them uh, the uh, presidency. That's the second event. The third event is that in Finland, where you have a right of central government at the moment, uh, so far I've been talking about people 
uh, on the on the left. In Switzerland, it's more artists and so on who were pushing the referendum. In in Finland, they are they, they, they say we want to have evidence-based policy, and there has been a push, an active debate for some years in Finland for a basic income, including by some parties that are now in the opposition, mainly the far left party and the green party, but also the young. Uh, section in the ruling party, the party of the Prime Minister, have been pushing for this idea. And so since the 1st of January this year until the end of December next year, there is a uh, an experiment going on in Finland with 2,000 people receiving something that can be regarded as a basic income. That is, they have a benefit that is unconditional, they can combine it with income from any uh, other source without limit, and they are no longer pushed into a job, they are not supposed to uh, be available uh, for work. But the people chosen are only people who are current, who were already unemployed before the start. It's not an experiment with a random sample of the whole population. And perhaps I'll only mention one fourth uh, recent fact, which is that a number of uh, big shots uh, in the high tech uh, sector or uh, in big business have been suddenly come out by saying, well, this is what we should go for huh? Elon Musk, uh, Tesla, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So shortly after our book was published by Harvard University Press, there was a graduation ceremony at Harvard where uh, Zuckerberg was getting an honorary degree. I don't know whether he read our book, but uh, he came out and said, well, you know, in order to face all the problems uh, today, we need to think seriously about the idea of a universal basic income. So, uh, and Richard Branson from uh, uh, came out with a similar statement and several other people. So you have from very different sides, you have a convergence on the same idea. Why? That's what I want to finish my little introduction. For why today? Why today? Why is there this interest? Also, a few, very few people very discreetly from the 19th century defended this idea. Then since uh, the mid-80s, since we created this network, then gradually the idea spread, but mainly through academics, some activists in a number of, uh, of countries. So why is there this interest now? And I think there are two fundamental reasons, which are, in a way, a, a broader awareness of, um, and, uh, and, and a more acute awareness of, of uh, two things which, uh, uh, I, which led me, in fact, in 1982 to thinking about this idea. The first one, the first one has to do with uh, <coughs> technological change, the sort of uh, forecasts that are being made now about automation, inter uh, artificial intelligence, robotization, etc., and the loss of jobs uh, that uh, go along with that. Now, I don't believe in an absolute rarefaction of jobs. These sort of forecasts, we've had them since, uh, the, uh, since the 1930s. Uh, there is a French group that still publishes uh, a magazine which is called uh, La Grande Relève des Hommes par la Machine, the great replacement of men by machine. And uh, uh, it's now issue one, 1183, so it's 100, 1,000. 183 months ago, they started saying every month that man is going to be replaced by machines and therefore we urgently need to do something about it. I don't believe in this sort of technological determinism, but I do believe that the conjunction, the combination of the sort of labor-saving techn technological change which we have and globalization, and the globalization of the market, these two things together lead to a polarization of uh, the in, in the income distribution. So some people who have the right assets, who own capital, who own intellectual property, who have the sort of skills that are highly valued by the worldwide market, these people see their income uh, increase and then in a cumulative way because if you have a very high income you can save more, invest more, invest in more profitable ways. But at the same time, the people who don't have these skills, or who have other skills, but certainly their sector, the whole sector become, becomes obsolete, are more and more people who fall under the threshold of poverty, even if they work full-time, or they are somewhat above it, but their fear, every 
year that they'll lose their job or that uh, the situation will change in such a way that they'll fall themselves under this trap, uh, under this uh, threshold, and they feel the same for their children. So, and we had this, uh, we had a, in terms of primary incomes within each country, you had something that was more equal, it becomes more and more unequal, and at the bottom, and uh, you feel you have to do something, otherwise there will be all these people who will be either starved or just receive this social assistance which will sort of block them in a situation of exclusion. And so faced with that, what do we do? The traditional answer was growth, growth, growth. If you have unemployment, precariousness, well, uh, boost the economic machine, make people produce more, make, make them consume more. If you need only uh, one person instead of four to produce a car, produce four cars instead of one, right? And so that, uh, but of course, when the idea came to me, this was already 10 years after the report of the Club of Rome that said, oh, um, uh, there are limits to growth. And uh, since then we've discovered the climate change, so we realized that the desirability of further material growth is really problematic. Many people say that in the rich countries, even the feasibility has become problematic. And Larry Summers, the former uh, president of Harvard, is speaking about secular stagnation, that we'll be stuck with very low rate of growth in the richer countries. Uh, so, and then we've had growth. And so countries, and you uh, not least, uh, have had a huge, uh, a, a huge level of growth since uh, the beginning of the so-called uh, golden 60s. I mean, growth, I mean, GDP per capita has become much higher, two or three times, depending on the countries, higher than it was at the time. And we still have all this, depending on the country, a high level of unemployment or a high level of precariousness or a high level of, uh, of uh, working, uh, of many working poor people, people who work full-time, sometimes more than full-time, and are still, uh, not above the, the level of, uh, of poverty. So what needs to do about it? And basic income in that context, then suddenly it picks and people say, well, you know, if maybe if we can't rely on growth, growth, growth in order to create these jobs, perhaps we can uh, enable people to reduce their working time more easily. Now people who work too much, who kill themselves by working too much, burn out and so on. Well, enable them to reduce their working time more easily by saying, well, there is an unconditional floor. If you reduce the working time, you have it. If you interrupt, you, you, you drop to, to do some more training or to breathe, you are entitled to it. Absolute security. And if they do so, of course, they free some jobs for other people who are currently excluded or can't get a good job, but can get a better job because other people will have left some of these jobs. Especially as, and that's related to the unconditionalities I mentioned at the beginning, especially as if you are on benefit and you start work, you can keep your benefit. That means you are not trapped in that situation of exclusion in which social assistance system uh, uh, tend to trap people, to retain people. Because now when someone who is on benefit finds a job, people say, congratulations, fantastic, you are great, and by way of reward, we take away your benefit, okay? With a basic income, you have this flow, you work, you find a little job, it may be part-time, you may not be able to do more because you have your children, because you are not psychologically sufficiently strong, because it's far from, from your house, you take a, 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 this little job that doesn't pay much, but uh, maybe not more than than, than you had as a benefit, but you can keep your benefit, you can combine it with uh, this job. And so that's the idea. So isn't that a more intelligent way of addressing the question of unemployment and related precariousness um, or, uh, or, or uh, poverty for people who are uh, working and working poor? Isn't that a more intelligent way? And growth, growth, growth and making the machine uh, the economic machine works so fast that you are going to kill the planet in the process. Mm -hmm. So that's one of, of the two reasons that led me to that idea a long time ago and that has become 
stronger today than it ever was, leading many other people and from the Finnish government to some uh, Swiss activists to Mark Zuckerberg to think seriously about that idea. The second reason, probably equally important, is that in the beginning of the 1980s, um, uh, this was a few years before uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, a major event for us in Europe, and the end of the Soviet regime. But people on the left, like me, I heard that in the introduction you said you were not quite sure whether I was left or right, but uh, if being on the left, and being on the left, what does it mean being on the left? It, it, for me, it doesn't mean being for more state and less market. Or it doesn't mean being systematically on the side of the trade unions, because sometimes the trade unions defend the, the corporatist interest of a small group of relatively privileged people. No, being on the left means being systematically in favor of the people who are the most vulnerable, who are the worst off in our society. And so people on the left in the early 80s, people like me on, on, the, on the left, thought that we absolutely needed a, a, a sort of utopia, a vision that would be a powerful alternative to the neoliberal utopia, which was beginning to really develop a very strong grip on the minds and then on the policies in our countries and on the institutions. We needed a powerful alternative to it. Uh, but uh, uh, an alternative to even a utopia of total submission to the market. But at the same time, this alternative utopia couldn't be the, the old socialist utopia of a total submission to the state, no? whether democratic state, uh, ideally or not. So we need something else. That view was, uh, was discredited. So we needed something else. And so I thought, well, isn't basic income not the only ingredient, but the central ingredient of what we need? That is, the idea that we could uh, use, exploit, mobilize all the dynamic uh, power of capitalism, well described by Marx, uh, not in order to produce jobs, 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 but in order to free people, to liberate them, and to provide them real freedom. And, uh, of course, you need many things for that, a good educational system, a good healthcare system. But you also need a way of supporting their incomes, their livelihood, which is unconditional, which gives them more real freedom to say no to certain jobs instead of being forced into them, and more real freedom to say yes to other activities, enabling them to, to, to try a startup, to get a training that may lead to nothing but corresponds to really what they want to do, to, to, to live a life for, as a musician for a while, to try, to try all sorts of things that correspond to their calling and to what they really want to do. So that was the alternative. Alternative that could be justified, needs to be justified in terms of social justice. But I think that anyone who is attracted both by the ideal of equality that there is something in equality that's very close to justice, but also attracted by the idea of freedom. If you, are you think that in your vision of a good society, you must make a place for both equality of freedom, then you must be interested in basic income. And that is, in a way, going back also to some of the ideals of, uh, uh, that Marx shared with the, the, with the, the so-called utopian socialists, uh, which was, uh, uh, shower for years and so on, which was the idea that we need to go towards a society in which people will uh, have their needs full satisfied and their basic needs satisfied unconditionally uh, without needing to pay for it, and where people will contribute voluntarily to society and to the economy because they will no longer be forced to do so by the sheer need to survive. And that is, in a way, what the basic income does. And so when a number of years ago, in the 1990s, I was invited by the, on the other side here, uh, by the Institute of Marxist-Leninism of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, I uh, presented basic income as a capitalist transition to communism. 
at the time, uh, one of my hosts said, well, it's a good time because Mr. Dunn just said the capitalism, socialism, no difference. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I, I explained that, in fact, uh, you could, and this was what the basic income was, a gradual increase in the basic income is, is within a market society and using the virtues of the market, but at the same time, bridling the market and controlling, regulating the market so that it doesn't create all the damage it creates uh, to a large extent today. And so how within the market society you could gradually increase the, the part of the social product which you distribute uh, unconditionally to everyone. That's what a, what a basic income is. And I believe that uh, today more than ever we need a utopia. We need a vision of the future and that will have, will not be realized uh, straight away, doesn't need to be realized straight away, but guides our steps towards a better society and at the same time strengthens us because when we have this vision, uh, it will also give more strength to, to our struggles for gradual improvement going in this direction. But to do so, and that, that's, I, I return to what I said at the beginning, and so you need to have this utopian vision, but it must be a smart utopian vision. And a smart utopian vision means one that you take the time to discuss, you listen to all the arguments of all sorts, economic, uh, ethical, uh, sociological, political, that can be made legal, that can be made uh, to uh, this idea, you think about them, um, you possibly modify your, your convictions if you are convinced by the argument and that's the sort of thinking that is uh, an engaged thinking so and not just uh, looking back uh, and, and uh, just uh, and be trying to be neutral no it's engaged but at the same time it wants to be intellectually robust huh, by listening carefully to the argument, explaining them as well as you can, sometimes more strongly than the people who oppose the idea, and, and then explaining them also to, to other people. That's what we've been trying to do in this book, and I'm very grateful for all the effort that has been put by the translator, by the editor, by the publisher, in making it available in uh, Chinese. So I know that complex characters is not quite the same as simplified, characters, but nevertheless with our publication in the three main languages in the world, uh, English, uh, uh, Spanish and uh, Chinese, it means that uh, half of the world population can read it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 那我們現在開放問答時間然後我好像蠻踴躍的那我先接兩個問題好了好嗎後面後面剛剛那我先說最後面 so first one, um, uh, first of all, um, thanks for your sharing. Uh, it's a very insightful speech, uh, especially the unconditional uh, basic income. So my question are, um, first of all, um, how do you see the uh, globalization that turns into you know, nationalism and the uh, uh, protectionism um, that surge into the uh, the president election victory of Donald Trump's and other uh, refugee program in Germany. Uh, how the basic income can help um, to prevent the surge of protectionism. Um, the second one, how do you see the? Uh, I mean, there are a couple small experiments in advanced country uh, such as Finland. Uh, French, and uh, I think of the other one. Um, but there are very few in developing countries, especially um, in Taiwan, for example. And uh, even that, um, the uh, controversial enforcement of the labor force recently that would be passed uh, 
that people cannot say no to the job that they don't want. How do you see that uh, transition, the basic income transition from the advanced country to um, to uh, developing country like Taiwan? Huh. Huh? Take two questions. Yeah, or three. Okay. Paris老师提到没有义务 is uh, does the basic income uh, address the existing uh, inequality such as gender or race and if not then is it compatible with the more traditional social assistance that's my question thank you okay we address these uh, uh, four questions in fact um, well uh, first question, nationalist protectionism. Um, well, I said basic income is a utopia, uh, that uh, it's part of a utopian vision for the future, that should provide an alternative to the other temptations, like nationalist temptation. You need to have some vision for your society, and for a number of people, uh, nationalist, uh, nationalism is attractive because they have nothing else apart from neoliberalism or something like that. Or uh, uh, terrorism is attractive for some people in my own city uh, because what sort of future is there for them? They are in, in society dominated by the market in which they have markets, that in which they have skills that don't promise them a very nice life, so they, they go for something extreme. So basic income is in a way a response or an alternative to nationalism in this sense. This being said, a, uh, a, a society and an economy that is closed to the outside has a, a greater facility, it's easier for such a society to introduce a basic income than one that is open in all sorts of ways. And because you, if capital, uh, goods, services and people can move freely between countries, obviously there is a, a, a pressure on any redistributive system, including one that takes the form of a basic income. Hence, the importance, and we, that's uh, the object of the last chapter in our book, uh, which about the question whether basic income is compatible with globalization uh, in this sense, and what can you do to address that challenge. We try to explain how, nevertheless, we believe that basic income at a national level, even in this context, is possible. And two, that we also need to think about basic income on a larger scale, which is possible in some conditions, and there is a discussion, for example, on the idea of a euro dividend, uh, basic income at the level of the European Union, which would serve a number of purposes, uh, uh, in addition to those I mentioned before, in terms of making our currency more viable, our common currency more viable, etc. But it is, a, and so it's a basic income is not a, a magic bullet that will get rid of uh, nationalism or of protectionism, but it is compatible with uh, trade and with free trade between countries, but you need to, uh, to think about the various ways in which generous basic income systems need to be protected 
and about how steps can be made at the same time to have a basic income on a high scale. Then um, the, the existing experiments, so the, the uh, main experiment that is going on is the one I mentioned in Finland. There are some vague projects in France, there are some more serious projects uh, in Canada. This, uh, uh, there is a serious project uh, privately funded in uh, California and Michigan, funded by uh, one the, the boss of uh, uh, an incubator called Y Combinator based in California. But there are also experiments, including uh, going on already now, or already performed in much poorer countries. But there is, was one major interesting experiment in uh, um, uh, Madhya Pradesh, in one of the states of India, uh, that is completed, though the results have been published. And there is one experiment just starting, uh, that uh, uh, funded by an NGO called Give Directly in Kenya, in, in Africa. And there are lots of other projects, but some are still too big to be worth talking about. So uh, there is nothing in a country uh, really comparable to Taiwan, uh, intermediate, but uh, why not start? So just take the initiative. <laughs> okay. Um, this being said, and that's related to the to the second question, um, I have uh, uh, strong doubts about the. Uh, well, I don't believe, uh, frankly, in the possibility for any feasible experiment to give us an answer to the question of whether a particular scheme, uh, even if um, even if it, the experiment is well designed methodologically, even if it's a really a basic income. I don't believe even the best experiment could answer the question whether that scheme is economically sustainable or not. Because there are intrinsic limits to what these experiments can show. Any experiment is for a short duration. In Finland, it's two years. Huh? So give directly in Kenya, they hope to do it uh, for more years. Uh, in uh, India, it was uh, three years. The earlier negative income tax experiments in the US uh, were also for a similar duration, one last for five years. So, but of course the way in which you react to a basic income, if you know that it's only temporary, will be different from the way in which you react if you know that for the rest of your life, you are going to have that basic income. That's one important limitation. The second uh, important limitation is that in an experiment, you always take a sample but of course the basic income will need to be paid by someone in the country in which it is introduced. This was not the case in, uh, in Kenya or, uh, uh, yeah, in, Kenya or in uh, India, where it was money coming from outside. In, uh, in the case of India, it was UNICEF that was funding uh, the experiment. But uh, in, uh, in Finland, for example, you have a sample consisting only of people who are unemployed, and you, they would have liked to, to put more people in the sample, but you can never put in a sample the people who will be net contributors to the scheme. If a basic income was introduced in my country, uh, I should, let's say 800 euros or 800 dollars per month, I wouldn't have to ask myself, what am I going to do with these 800 dollars? I would be among the net contributors. Maybe my net income would fall by 100 euros, 150 euros or something like that. But if there were an experiment in my country, uh, it wouldn't be possible to put people like me in the experiment and tell me, uh, although I would be personally ready to do it, but you can't uh, say, well, we had uh, a random choice of a few people and now, sir, you've been uh, uh, the happy winner of this lottery, and for the next three years you are going to have uh, a net income lower than anyone else in this country with the same income, right? That's what it would mean, putting net contributors into the sample. You cannot do that. Huh? In Finland, uh, people uh, cannot refuse if they are chosen among the 2,000, they have to accept. But all these people gain from the experiment. They get the same amount of money and they have less constraints. So that's not a problem. But if for the net contributors, you cannot possibly do that. In all the cases of the experiments, they have to try to 
get around the constitutional principle of equality between citizens, and I can do so. If none of the people in the sample is worse off, then, uh, in, then would otherwise be the case. And the third very important limitation, and we'll have to be careful with that when the results of the Finnish experiment uh, will be known, is that some of the important beneficial uh, effects of a basic income will not be visible. I'll mention uh, one that is related to the other question that was asked, um, the effect on women. Well, uh, any, any basic income scheme would, uh, however it's funded, will uh, be a redistribution from men to women for a very simple reason. Uh, it's the arithmetic consequences of three universal facts. One is that the average participation of women in the labor market is less than the average participation of men. Two is that the average wage of women per hour of work is less than the average wage of men. And three, uh, women own on average less capital and therefore um, less capital income than men. So however you fund it, whether through consumption tax, uh, income tax, corporate tax, whatever, it will be a redistribution of men to women, of both income but also possibilities. And of course what is likely to happen, and it's confirmed by what can be learned from experiments, is that more women than men uh, will reduce, with unchanged uh, wages, will reduce their labor supply. Because they they think, well, I earn, because I earn little and less than men. In fact, I, the household will lose less if it's the woman who reduces working time uh, due to the fact that the, the, the income of poor families would be increased thanks to the, uh, to the basic income. But, of course, if, you, if the jobs in which there are many women uh, uh, have more difficulty finding people interested in filling them because this will have an effect on the wage and the market will react in such a way that the working conditions will be improved, perhaps uh, the timetable, the schedule will be more flexible so that it's more suitable for women, but also wages will go up in this case. And so that uh, what is sometimes presented by some feminists uh, uh, or, or also by, by some men uh, who think they know better than these women what is good for these women to do when they are given more choice. And what is sometimes presented as an argument against uh, basic income because women are likely to reduce in an immediate sense their uh, labor supply more than men is in fact uh, something that will lead to a reduction of the wage gap between men and women because there will be this fall in the labor supply for jobs that are occupied mainly uh, by women. So, uh, I don't know whether this is fully clear, I'll try to explain it uh, better uh, tomorrow when uh, at the, in the, in the second of the lectures I give at the, at the university about the economic uh, viability of a basic income. But here I just want to give this as an example of the sort of thing that even in the best experiment you cannot discover. Because you, in Finland you have these 2,000 people in a labor market of 5 million. So, of course, this effect on the wage level is totally, in, will not exist when you have so few people, uh, so few people involved. So, that, uh, uh, that is uh, 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 the important uh, uh, dimension. And so, in the case of Finland, some, sometimes people say, uh, ask what are the results so far? And uh, I saw someone the other day who said that one of the beneficiaries uh, in Finland published a book about what he did with his time. And uh, but this is a ridiculous this anecdotal evidence, of course, is not uh, serious about the effects of, uh, the, the effects would be very difficult to assess. Only because today, with any experiment, because of the internet, people who receive the basic income suddenly say that on Facebook, and then someone else says it on Facebook, and then the journalists come to interview them, and then more people say that they have received it. Uh, I met twice this summer the director of the uh, Finnish experiment. He said his main concern is to protect this sample from the interest of all the people in the world who wants to know what his people are doing in this sample. 
and uh, he doesn't want at the end of the two years, then uh, the people will have to write a report about what they did and didn't do. And so at the end of the two years, I say, oh, yes, my life changed. I spent my time talking to journalists and to activists and to politicians who came to see it. And of course, all this would trouble the, uh, disturb the, the, the experiment completely. Then uh, finally, then uh, on the more general question, what will it do to inequalities? And so uh, uh, just, of course, in countries in which uh, only women are relatively discriminated, but there are ethnic groups that are discriminated. Well, uh, is the thing that is their participation in the labor market is on average less, their wages are on, av on average less, their ownership of capital is on average less. So however you fund it, they will gain from the operation. Again, not only in terms of incomes, but in terms of options open to them. They will be able to have a wider range of choice uh, open to them. Uh, does it mean that to reduce inequalities, we only need to give a basic income? Very important to fund the basic income and more of our expenditures through capital income, not only labor income. What has been happening in recent decennia is that the share of labor in value added in the social product has been reduced, has been diminishing. And of course, we don't want these uh, Mark Zuckerbergs and so on say, yes, yes, a great idea, basic income, providing it's funded, it's paid for by the workers, while we can keep increasing our share of total product. Of course, we need, and that's why international organization, cooperation is so important. We need to be able to seize and to grasp, to, to to get hold of, uh, to catch uh, our wealth far better than we do now. And because capital in particular is very mobile, it's very important that capital should pay, and including the ownership of intellectual property rights, should pay, contribute its share to any redistributive system far more than is currently the case. And that will, of course, uh, reduce inequalities at the top, not only at the bottom.我的question是 我想請問其實基本上收入基本上在當代最主要是火影資本主義的比例特別是福利國家對於基本收入而言就是我的問題有三個城市跟鄉村
钱嘛，那锅台米跟我们一般老百姓拿的钱都是一万块的话，那是不是其实也是一种不公平？那我先问这个问题好了，谢谢。谢谢
you have, and that's related to the other question, if you have uh, a very, if you do that in a very large area, for example, if you have even a modest basic income in Europe, something like 200 euros uh, to 250 dollars or something per person uh, throughout uh, Europe, or well, the poorer parts of the European Union, Bulgaria, Romania, will have a significant uh, recurrent uh, increase in the average income, in the total income. And so because uh, there will be this territorial dimension, you can expect a lasting effect on the so upward effect on the prices in the area that is uh, poor of the European Union. And so I, I, I sum up, if, it's <coughs> if the basic income is funded in a recurrent way by money creation, it leads to inflation. And runaway inflation, that's not the way to go. If it's funded by an external source, regular, uh, so uh, the, uh, it, like in Alaska, it doesn't lead to a, a, the price level in Alaska is probably higher than it would otherwise be the case, but it doesn't create a serious problem. If it's funded by taxation, then there is no increase in the overall purchasing power, just a redistribution. And then there can be uh, 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 an increase, at least in the short run, of the prices in those, for those social groups or those territorial areas uh, which gain most from uh, the redistribution involved. But there is no reason to believe that this increase in prices would compensate and it would reduce the positive impact on purchasing power of these poorer parts of the population. But not offset them uh, completely. Then, um, and that uh, replies then in part or touches on the, the last uh, question that was asked about uh, geographical uh, differences because precisely when you have a very large area and some people have been proposing also uh, to have a, a differentiation of uh, the levels of uh, basic income so that uh, basic, if you have a European-wide basic income, that it wouldn't be the same uh, amount of uh, euros. Uh, it wouldn't be the same amount of euros all over the place, but it should be related to the cost of living. And, uh, and such then in Romania and Bulgaria, they would have less than in Germany and Luxembourg. And I certainly think that that uh, uh, can uh, make sense. Um, I think. <coughs> I think it's uh, better to stick within a particular country to the same amount uh, all over and not to start differentiating uh, between, uh, between cities or between cities and the countryside or between neighborhoods in the same uh, city. Uh, you may uh, <coughs> want to have top-ups and so supplements above the basic income. Uh, uh, supplements of social assistance with some conditions attached to it in order to take care of these differences, in order to enable, for example, poor people to stay in the neighborhoods where they've lived for their whole life. Um, but the basic income is such, in my view, should be uniform. And therefore, it would mean a systematic redistribution from the cities, which are richer, to the countrysides and, uh, and from the, the booming cities and the cities that attract lots of people because they are dynamic like Taipei uh, to uh, cities that are decaying and where all the prices are lower because uh, uh, housing prices are lower because there are less people wanting to live there. And so it's a healthy system in any country that the richer portions of the country should be distributed in a systematic way to the poorer parts also in order to enable people to stay in the poorer parts rather than everyone flocking into the cities. I remember that uh, I went, once went to see uh, President Cardoso of Brazil with my friend, uh, Senator Eduardo Suplicy, who is a great advocate of basic income. And the first, an important first step in that direction was in 1990s, before, just before the Lula, first Lula government, was to introduce some sort of guaranteed minimum income, not restricted to the richer municipalities that had been trying it, but all over the country, including in the, in the poorer communes of the Nordeste of Brazil. And Cardoso, the president, was 
uh, one of the reasons why he was attracted by this idea and then decided to have to introduce shortly afterwards uh, federal support for to, to make it possible to have some sort of guaranteed income all over the place, not, not basic income but a conditional one, was that it would keep the people in the countryside instead of having them all flocking into the favelas, into the, the slums of uh, São Paulo, uh, Rio de Janeiro, etc. So there is this population stabilization uh, effect uh, which is related to the fact that you have a single amount for the whole of the country. You don't give more uh, in cities than you give in the countryside, despite the fact that life is more expensive in cities than in the countryside. Then um, there is the there was then the second uh, question: uh, Why not uh, putting? Why was it not put into practice earlier? And um, what is the current reaction in countries with a developed state, a welfare state? Um, Yes, uh, why not earlier? Well, uh, I, I also wondered at the beginning when I had the idea first, I thought it is such a good idea that it would be implemented straight away. But I realized it's, uh, it's not easy because you, it's quite a radical uh, change, not so much in uh, uh, administ administration or even in the redistribution of income, but it's really the principle that is so different. And so, you, you really switch from, uh, just as you had to switch from help targeted to the poor to solidarity between workers, here is really the idea that you distribute in a fair way uh, this uh, huge gift that is given to us from the past in the form of technological development, in the form of capital accumulation, etc. And so the reason why our real income in this country, like in mine, so much higher than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago uh, is something that has nothing to do with the way we work today. Uh, not we, our real income is so much higher not because we work harder or longer hours today. It's because we benefit from all uh, from all this uh, technological progress and ways of organizing our societies more broadly. And what the basic income does is just distribute that more fairly. But it takes a while for people to perceive uh, a basic income in this way. They say, well, it doesn't fit, that's not. Uh, and you give them money to even to people who are not uh, uh, in a situation of risk. And, uh, and uh, the social insurance says, well, you pay for the unlucky. Here you say, no, you distribute this uh, in a fair way. It's like manna that falls from heaven. You distribute it in a fair way. So you really need this. Uh, uh, this, this switch. Um, there were some countries, <coughs> sorry, in particular the Netherlands, Holland, where it looked as if it, we were nearly there. Because in Holland, in fact, most people receive, uh, nearly all people receive either some benefit, some social benefit, or a, a tax credit, uh, a, a sort of lump sum reduction of their tax liability uh, in such a way that practically everyone gets an explicit or implicit transfer from the state. There are just a few exceptions. And they have a very broad uh, uh, guaranteed minimum income system, conditional, and so practically everyone gets it. But then it was proposed by several ministers in one of the government from two different parties. And uh, immediately it led to chaos within the government. And there is something, and that's one of the reasons why it's not yet implemented. It's an idea that doesn't correspond to the usual cleavage, that may be related to what you said at the beginning, to the usual cleavage between right and left. And you have within the same party, and within the same socialist party in Europe, or within the same liberal party in Europe, or the same Christian democratic party in Europe, even within the same green party in Europe, people who are emotionally in favor, and people who are emotionally against the idea. And so any party leader say, oh, I'm not going to push this idea because this is going to split my party and there will be a divide within my own party. And so this is no doubt one of the reasons why it takes a, a long time for a politician to dare to propose it. Huh? As so it sometimes happens now, like uh, the socialist candidate uh, for in France, uh, for president uh, 
uh, in France. So what's the situation now? Uh, well, what you've had, so that's what we try to describe in our chapter seven. We give a sort of pretty comprehensive uh, overview uh, of uh, the attitude towards basic income within some important parts of civil society, particularly women and the, the feminist movement and the trade union movement, but not only, also the movement of the unemployed, for example, and then within the various political families. And within the political families, and there are two groups that have been traditionally quite receptive, and not uh, unanimously, but quite receptive to the idea. They are the Greens. Uh, whenever there is a, no, a sort of formal Green Party, that's certainly the case in Finland, for example, but also to some extent in Germany, but very controversial within the party. Uh, and then left liberal parties, parties who are pro-market, but at the same time quite redistributive. And when such parties exist, there is one such party in Holland, for example, uh, the Lib Dems in the United Kingdom were like that, at least at some stage. Now they have been, they have been uh, <coughs> dilapidated uh, uh, recently. But so within that part of the spectrum, you have some support. You don't get support from the ultra neoliberal right, who say, well, it is state intervention, what proportion of, the, of uh, GDP will go into that, etc. And you don't get support, and that's, uh, you may get support from the far left, yeah. Yanis Varoufakis, for example, the former uh, Greek finance minister under the Syriza uh, government, so very flamboyant uh, uh, economist, and one, he was a postdoc at, at my, in my uh, chair uh, in uh, Louvain in the 1990s. He defends it. But the social democratic movement, the socialist movement in general in Europe, and the trade union movement, is uh, extremely reticent and often very hostile. And that is, of course, uh, an important component. So the dialogue with the trade unions on that, and we have a long section in the book explaining uh, the various reasons why the trade unions are not very enthusiastic about it. It's beginning to change now. There are a number of uh, voices. There was a book by a major American trade unionist, uh, with the subtitle, How a Universal Basic Income Would Revive the American <coughs> Dream, or something like that. Also in Europe, you can see that things are moving. But uh, there is, of course, the trade unions have been fighting to develop the social insurance system and the welfare state as we know it, are often involved in its management, and they are reluctant. And they see that as a threat to what they have built, that just as the people who were running the social assistance scheme saw the creation of social insurance as a threat uh, to what they had achieved. And just as the church and the, the, the Christian organizations saw the very beginning in the 16th century, the very beginning as social assistance with the public authorities taking charge of the poor as a threat again to their mission and to their power. So it's normal that you should expect that, but uh, with good arguments, you can, and taking into account the current situation of the labor market with increasing precariousness, with more and more people not properly protected by social insurance, I'm sure that more and more trade unions will join the fund on our side. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I, I forgot there was a second component that for the third, uh, 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 from the third person who asked the question. Uh, yes, is it fair to give to, to the rich? Huh? Uh, why not, if you have the money, why not give it all to the poor? Huh? That's the question. Yes, and the answer, not because it's better for the rich, but because it's better for the poor. There's a, a paradox there, but needs, that needs to be understood. We try to explain it in the book, but I'll quickly give you the, the intuition. Huh? So, if you say, and that's related to the universal character of basic income, in contrast to the means-tested character and the income-tested character of the traditional uh, social assistance. So tra traditionally you say, well, we have this money, we want to relieve poverty, and so we focus that money on the poor. We try to find the poor and we give them that money. This has uh, two 
um, main, uh, these are two main problems. One is the so-called rate of take-up. That is, what is the proportion of the poor who are entitled to uh, these benefits and who actually get these benefits. In France, for example, in France there are some data about that. Uh, they have a, a pretty general, and fairly generous, uh, in international comparison, uh, conditional minimum income scheme. But about 50% of the people entitled to it, and the poor people entitled to it, uh, actually receive it. Why so low? For two reasons. One, if it's only for the poor, well, you need to have a procedure for the poor to go and claim it. They can't wait until the end uh, when the tax uh, authorities will have examined uh, all the tax declarations, etc. So they need to, to go and, and go to one administration, find it, and then it's not the right one, they have to wait, it's not, or then it's online, and then they try online, but they don't have a computer, the, the, the screen freezes, etc., uh, etc. Et so there's a problem of information for these people. For guys like you in the room, no problem. Huh? So you are all nerds who know exactly how to do and how to deal with that. But many of the people who are in this situation, people who are less educated, who are, live under very stressful conditions and are not equipped in order to get the information to handle, to treat uh, in a, and to, to interact in a decent way with the officials in charge, public servants uh, in charge of the administration of it. That's one reason why there is a low rate of take-up. Another reason is that unavoidably, even with the most humane of systems, there is an aspect of humiliation. If it's given only to the poor, you have to go to the thing and you <coughs> say, I'm destitute. I'm destitute, and moreover, I'm not destitute because I chose it, because I cheated, or because, no, I'm, I'm destitute because I'm pathetic, because I'm unable to, to look after my family, to look after myself, and so on. Many people don't want to recognize to, the, to themselves that they are in that situation. And as re even if they knew, if they know how to do it in order to get it, they don't want to do it because it would recognize that they are really among the bottom of society. That's why the rate of take-up, and so that has been shown in the case of family benefits, child benefits, and that uh, the rate of take-up among the poor is much higher when you give it to everyone. Rich and poor is given automatically uh, you don't need to go and check uh, how much people earn, they get it. So that's the, the first reason why it is better to hold the poor that one gives also to the rich. Given to everyone, no shame to have, and uh, it's automatic, no procedure, and uh, that's the one reason. And the second reason is what I alluded to before, which is the so-called poverty trap, uh, which is that if it's given only to the poor, you say, well, it's the best of intentions. Right? It's, it's good, you say, well, we have this money, let's give it to the poor. But it means that as soon as the poor is no longer poor, because they managed to find a little job, you take the benefit away. And as a result of that, the poor may say, well, it's not worth to try and work, because uh, I, I am going to earn just a little more in, more in net terms than my benefit and I'll have to pay for my travel to work and for more clothes and for child care for my children. So it's not worth it, I won't do it. Uh, moreover, uh, if I, if the job does pay more, a bit more than, uh, than my present situation, if you take everything to account, I don't know whether I'll be able to stick it out for long. Maybe the job, maybe the boss will sack me after a while because I'm not good enough or maybe I, will, I won't be able to, to keep going because of uh, it's more difficult for the children, uh, who I, I, leave, uh, I have to leave uh, alone at home for two. And then if I give up the job or if I lose the job after two or three months or six months, then it may be complicated to come back to my benefit. There may be two months where I have no income and I have no savings and I go into debt and so on. And so that means that if uh, it's given only to the poor, you have this trap, what's called poverty trap, or exclusion trap, or employment trap, dependency trap, and you, you, you prefer to stay with your benefit, mm, that even if there is a possibility of a job, mm, because of this uncertainty and because of the lack of a difference. <coughs> with a basic income, you give it to everyone. 
rich and poor, so you keep it if you, and you are certain to keep it, it's absolutely secure. And get that enables more people, not all people, but enables more people to get out of the trap. So that's and the, the two things and the rate of take up and this dependency trap, the two reasons why it is better for the poor, not better for the rich, to give to the rich as well as to the poor. Because the rich, or the relatively rich, huh, people like me, that was my example before, will not become richer as a result of receiving a basic income because it will need to be fun. And in some schemes, I'm saying, well, instead of being given the basic income and being taxed more, where it's just that the basic income is given to all as tax credit, refundable tax credit. So my tax liability is reduced by the amount of the basic income. So that was my answer to, the, to that question. Perhaps I should be the the Q&A session. Uh, 这个地方，然后我们等一下会有一些时间，所以呃，就是呃，大家还可以到前面来，还可以啊，就是如果有书的话，还可以让呃教授签名。那我们这个时候我们先掌声，谢谢一下教授。